Hi, Bleska, how are you? Hello. Um, so Global Challenges is brand new this year. It's only going to be starting um, with new students uh, entry 2022, so that's fantastic. And um, Valeska is a professor um, in political science here in DCU in the School of Law and Government. And her talk today will be, um, it's around global challenges, but with the topic of citizen science and the UN Sustainable Development Goals. Um, so I'm going to hand it over to you, uh, Valeska, to share your screen and you, you can do that. Okay. Yes, you can indeed. Yes. So uh, first, I want to say good afternoon to all of you and feel very welcome to this to this TASA lecture, uh, which is part of the Global Challenge Program in DCU. Uh, thanks, Colette, for this uh, introduction. I'm Valeska Lima, and I'm Assistant Professor in Politics in the School of Law and Government. And I'm here today to do two things. The first is to talk a little bit about the Global Challenge course, which is this new program. And the second thing is to share with you a little bit of what's studying in global challenges, uh, in, this, in this new global challenge course, uh, will look like. So the topic I have for today um, is a lecture in citizen science, which is not just a cool or a trend, but it's something that has great potential to, to advance knowledge uh, and at the same time collaborate to the implementation of key UN sustainable uh, development goals. So First thing, um, before I start this lecture, I want to briefly comment on, on the program. So um, I'm going to say something about this new degree. And the first thing I want to say about it is uh, why we should consider this course. So why, why do global challenges? To put it simple, uh, the, main, uh, uh, the main goal of the global challenges course is to tackle global challenges, which is uh, in that case, a way to use the value the value of uh, scientific evidence, scientific research to address uh, the problems faced in, in everyday life. So, and what are those problems exactly? There are so many out there, but of course I can mention a few. So for example, almost 10% uh, um, almost of the world population, they're affected by hunger. One in three people do not have uh, access to safe drinking water. Two out of five people, they do not have access to, to basic uh, hand washing facilities with soap and water at home. And 13% of the global population is still lacks access to, to power, to electricity in their, in their homes. So, and those are the global challenges um, on the UN Sustainable Development Goals, which are the SDGs. So in this course, we want to form students that are going uh, to be change makers, meaning people who can provide solutions to address some of those problems. And um, addressing these problems, of course, they are very hard, but they're extremely hard in some cases. But then we already know that some solutions, they are connected to technology. So there are out there technological approaches that can help us to understand and actually have an impact on those problems, even if they are very complex. So this new course is uh, in, in this intersection between social science and technology. And this is going to be a unique combination of those two areas. And there is nothing like this um, in Irish universities at the moment. In terms of career, um, in terms of career prospects, um, graduates in this course, um, they will be future leaders. That's what we envisage for them. They will be big picture thinkers. Uh, they will be creative problem solvers, and they will be socially engaged and passionate about social science and technological innovation. So this course is very, very distinctive from what you find in other universities. So here in this graph, um, you can have a good idea of what's going to happen in the four years of the course. So here you have the skills and the competences that the students do, they will be able to develop when they're doing this course to become uh, the change makers of the future. So students, they will be exploring new technologies, they will think ahead, they'll be able to think ahead of future problems, and especially finding solutions to local and, and global challenges. So together, all, all those global challenges approach, they are the integration of knowledge and skills that students they will develop uh, across uh, a high number, a large number of topics. And um, this is everything about the global challenge for now, because um, <clears throat> I now want to give you an illustration of uh, how this course is, 
is distinctive. And today I will focus on a particular aspect where technology and global challenges, the cross paths, which is citizen science. So um, citizen science is something that has attracted a lot of attention um, the media, um, in research organizations, international organizations like the UN, the World Bank, the OECD, and also in some, some local communities. But before I tell you what exactly is citizen science, I want to ask you, uh, what do you think is citizen science? So when you hear these words or when you read those two words together, what comes to your mind? So I want to know that, and I have this quick poll. Uh, Colette, can you, can you put the, the poll up, please? So um, I have some options. So you can have a look and see what citizen science they mean to you when you, when you hear those words and select the one that makes more sense to you. So um, Colette, I think you can, you can open the pool for responses. So I have I have opened it there, Valeska, and people okay. are responding. So I'll okay, okay, great, great. Um, I'll let them give them ten more seconds, maybe. Yes, yes, okay. <laughs> so, so the first option, um, what is citizen science? Uh, is it data collection of participants, objects of research studies? The second one, citizens doing science. Uh, the third one, people with PhDs doing science. Sorry, doing research on the most common diseases that affect citizens or uh, D a way of carrying out research without ethical approval. So and let's see. So we yeah. have, uh, can you see that, Vanessa? Yes, I can see. Yeah, okay, good, yeah. Okay, that's, that's a very interesting result. So most of the people, 6 7%, think that is A, data collection of participants or objects of research studies, 22% citizens doing science, and 11% people with PhDs doing research on, on the most common diseases. And no one, okay, a few people. <laughs> would think it's the last one. Uh, you can close, Colette. Thank you. Okay, so here's the, here's the response. It's uh, letter B, citizens uh, doing science. I, I just want to say uh, the, the answer here is actually the most simple one. So maybe you didn't know about it uh, and you were shocked like the surprised cat because it's just that simple. Citizen science, it means citizens doing science. Maybe you are not surprised because uh, perhaps you have heard about citizen science or have even participated uh, in citizen science projects because uh, there's some of them happening in Ireland at the moment. But the, the fact here is that citizen science is this science that's open to the public. So citizens, they can, they can collaborate in many different ways to scientific studies. So in other words, and I like to put it this way, it's a new form of public participation in research. So it actually encourages citizens and scientists to, to, to collaborate, to work together and um, to find new ways to solve uh, major problems. So a little bit more about citizen science because now, now we have a good understanding or maybe a good general idea uh, uh, that's good enough for us to move on. So over the past decades, citizen science has gained a lot of popularity as a new way to open science to the public. And to put it in a simple way, uh, citizen science is the participation of people from outside the usual place where science usually is done. What are those spaces? Usually universities, government bodies, research centers, for example. So one of the most interesting things about citizen science is that it can engage people from all walks of life, meaning that you don't need to be a professional scientist or have a PhD to be able to do science to, to, to generate this very rich and useful knowledge. So in practice, uh, participation citizen science projects, um, they can increase people's awareness of scientific issues and also provide informal education to people. And um, a lot of people also see this uh, citizen science not just as a way to create knowledge, but also as a way to democratize science. And I say this because recent research has, has been showing us that, that uh, there is a participatory turn in, in science policies. So, and this supports the claim that citizen science can lead to the democratization of science by turning science from a closed activity or, uh, into an open one. And this makes a big difference. So if we try to find a definition for citizen science, um, this is not easy because there are several 
ways of doing citizen science out there. So internationally, there is not a specific one because there is so much variation uh, in, in the way that citizen science is applied and I, also in the context it is applied. But I, myself in particular, I like this one because I think it's, it, it's comprehensive. So it says, citizen science is the involvement of non-professional scientists in scientific research and data gathering, which presents opportunities for both data collection and public participation. Okay, so hopefully it's clear, but then maybe some people there may be asking, what can citizen science actually do? Is anyone qualified to do citizen science? And the most important question is, what is good for? What's the, the what's, what's that that's useful in citizen science? So we can look into that uh, in parts. So first, how it works, how citizen science works. There are different ways to do it, but this one is one of the best formulas, or we can say this is um, one of the best good practices in doing citizen science. So there are models of uh, doing that. So the first one is uh, to find the research question, the scientific question, to, to find the scientists or the team of, uh, uh, of a research scientists working on the project to, and then the, the next phase is to develop tests and refine protocols, data forms and support materials. And then um, it's necessary to find participants to recruit them and especially to train them because uh, not everyone is going to have the same background and they need to be trained for a specific task so they complete so they can complete that uh, those tasks in the most appropriate way to generate good data. So data is generated, it's accepted, it's cleaned and it's displayed and then it's analyzed then there is the dissemination of results and the measure of outcomes. So this is generally the process of implementation of a citizen science project. And if we take all those steps together, they use the collective strength. They use the collective strength of the community to identify research questions, to collect and analyze the data, to make new discoveries, and especially to, 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 to develop technologies and new applications. And all that to understand and solve uh, global challenges, global problems. So now is where um, the UN Sustainable Development Goals, the SDGs, uh, it gets involved with citizen science, or maybe it's the other way around. That's, that's where citizen science gets involved in the UN Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, so, what, so first, what is the, the SDGs? So those are uh, the UN vision for achieving a sustainable future. They are very important elements of the post-2015 uh, development agenda that created this renewed global partnership to help secure the means for a better society. So there are a set of indicators there and they were formulated to monitor the progress of the 17 goals and 169 targets. There are a lot of them and those targets that they have even more indicators to measure if uh, the targets they are being met or achieved. So and that's where uh, citizen science, they meet as SDGs because um, the UN and most national governments, they are not fully able to properly monitor all the dimensions of the goals using traditional data sources alone. So basically what I'm saying is that governments and universities, they cannot track everything. They cannot do that by, by themselves all the time, everywhere. Uh, and this is a challenge where, where citizen science, sorry, um, uh, citizen science can help to address. So here, um, I wish I could have, uh, have made this bigger, but it was, uh, I had a problem with space in this screen, but I hope you can see an app here. So what I'm showing here is um, uh, some of the SDGs indicators, and they provide a good idea uh, if targets are being met. So here in this image, I'm showing the areas where citizen science is already making a contribution to SDGs. So um, the citizen science projects that they are already contributing, they are in green. You can, you can find them there. So uh, in yellow, you, you, uh, you can see the areas where citizen science exists, but could contribute more. So this is about potential. And uh, the gray ones, uh, this is where there is little or no alignment yet. So where do you see the black borders, um, it means that there is some kind of overlap with other 
uh, with other uh, data collection sources like the Earth Observation, which is a platform that, that collects data um, that could be used for SDGs, but it was created first, first before the, the SDGs. And when we, we look at the um, into the areas where citizen science contributes the most, usually uh, those are um, the SDG 15, which is life on land, the SDG 11, which is sustainable cities, SDG 3, which is good health and well being, and the SDG 6, which is clean water and sanitation. So if you look at the first one, for example, no poverty, it has 14 indicators. So citizen science projects have potential to contribute perhaps to all of them, and they have already started. But this collaboration is small at the moment because there are a few challenges on the way, which I'm going to speak about, and it could uh, contribute to more uh, to over half of them. But as you can see, most of the indicators are still in grade, and uh, sorry, in, in grade. And this happens because um, science contributions, they, are, have, they have been happening for some time, but there is a lot to add to, to advance. And this is because uh, sometimes technology is not available for that. So tracking the progress of uh, uh, the SDGs is not easy. And this is a problem that has already been recognized by the UN. So for example, uh, a UN staff leading uh, the UN Environment Program, you can see her picture there, uh, Jillian Campo, she said in 2020 about gathering environmental data, she said this, we are currently almost five years into the 2030 sustainable development agenda, yet we do not have sufficient data for tracking the environmental, the, the environmental dimensions of the sustainable development goals. So what she's saying here, she's highlighting a real problem because data is not also um, hard to get, it's also expensive. So just to give you an idea, um, a normal uh, census of the population ranges from uh, hundreds of millions of dollars uh, and, uh, and uh, other research methods that they are sample based, for example, like uh, household, uh, household surveys, they cost between uh, $406,000 to $1 billion, depending on the type of survey used. So generate data and collecting data, it's, it can be very expensive. So due to these um, issues of sometimes highly prohibited, uh, prohibitive costs, uh, the cycle of data collection is often not frequent, and then traditional data sources can quickly become outdated. And there is also issues uh, in relation to accuracy, openness, and the coverage of some official stats. So here you can see what, I, what I'm um, trying to say about trying to explain about what the, the about what are the traditional and no traditional sources so this is i think there is out there um, a whole area of research that says that uh, data produced through citizen science can complement and improve sdgs uh, especially when we consider that there are um, out there emerging new sources that can fill data gaps so here in this picture you can see some of the traditional and no traditional data sources the non-traditional are presented in black on the on the top half. So in these traditional data sources, this is the data collected by national statistical offices, offices like uh, here in the in Ireland we have the CSO, and also by government ministries and international organizations. So those are the main sources that they provide uh, input into SDG reporting. But traditional data sources are they are not sufficient for measuring SDGs, and this new approach proposes that uh, no traditional data would be uh, useful to complement official systems for SDG reporting with new non-traditional data sources. So in blue, you can find those which are identified as, as non-traditional. So for example, data from air pollution uh, monitoring stations, they are used by the World Health Organization, known as, as WHO, to measure uh, the annual mean, uh, mean levels of pollution causing respiratory diseases in, in cities. And this data is collected by citizens and shared with scientists. So here I have um, some examples of uh, where citizen scientists, they contribute. So citizen scientists are those people who are not employed as scientists, but they do science. So um, they can get involved in several stages of, of the scientific process. And these range is normally from the data collection to 
to be part of the entire process from, 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 from beginning to end. So just to give you an example of some projects out there collaborating to, to, to the monitoring of SDGs, uh, normally, the, I think the majority of them, they are focused on biodiversity and conservation. So those are the two areas where there is a strong citizen science presence and where the contributions are already in evidence. So the first example is uh, the Litter Intelligence Project, which collects data on litter density in coastal areas. And uh, they use this data to organize data cleaning and also to create educational projects. And this is very useful for, for policymakers to know where to act, for example, to start a beach cleaning campaign. Um, another project is the Red List Index, which is organized by an international group that focuses on conservation. They have over 5,000 citizen scientists spread around the globe. And what do they do? They register science, uh, sites of uh, animals that are in, the, in, in danger of extinction and they track their habits and locations. So another project, uh, the third one there is the Global Mosquito Alert, which is a new science in, a new, uh, a new citizen science innovation that uh, is putting together a network of global surveillance to control diseases that are caused by mosquitoes. Both of those diseases, they, they happen in, in tropical countries. There is not much data available and their goal is simple in a way, but it's also very hard to achieve they are trying to create a repository of information about how, uh, how to best use and customize information about mosquitoes and then create toolkits for local implementation of projects. And the final one, uh, this is the OpenStreetMap, which I think I have already seen or perhaps even used it. This is actually a fully collaborative citizen science project, which is uh, led by online community and it's also open to researchers and for research. It's, it can be used for research, which is helping to monitor, to, to measure the, the, the accessibility of, of um, rural populations to roads, which is one of the SDGs indicators. So here I want to highlight one particular project, which is uh, the Open 17 Challenge. So the idea here is to involve citizens in, in tackling, in, in fighting uh, as, uh, a specific global challenge. And this is especially connected to, to the SDG 11, which is about making cities more inclusive, resilient, and, and sustainable. So this is a very comprehensive citizen science uh, project because it encompasses all 17 SDGs in a way. And this is not an easy task. And because this is a huge task, they normally focus on actions that are concentrated on uh, climate change and gender inequality, paying attention to SDGs that, that, that they're addressing those two, two topics. So how this is done? This is done in that case, particularly via data crowdsourcing, which is a kind of participatory method for building data sets with the help of a large group of people. So this method is normally low cost and can collect a lot of data, which is valuable and uh, it's normally dispersed and then these, these projects collapse all that. So I think they're doing very nice, the Open 17, which is to push forward uh, the understanding that some of the data sets, they're able to, to, to monitor progress towards the SDGs that they are local in nature. So, so data could be better generated and collected by individuals and organizations uh, in their local communities. There are uh, several partner, uh, partners in this project. Um, among universities, local government, and government agencies. And their challenge, among other things, is to create open source hardware uh, and, and also softwares uh, that they can provide a platform that can not just store data, but that can automate the validation of, of procedures. And this is where uh, someone doing, so this is where uh, someone doing global challenge could, could collaborate. So um, I also want to give you an example um, that's, uh, of citizen science that's done here in Ireland. This one is called uh, the Crowd for Access, sorry, Crowd for Access, uh, which maps food path accessibility in Ireland. So this is basically a partnership between citizens and, um, and professional in, in technology areas uh, that they come together to learn how accessible are the food paths in, in our cities. 
So people collaborate by sending pictures and reports of how accessible are the footpaths in their own neighborhoods. These data can then be used by local authorities to improve and, and make investments that can improve access to everyone. The second example uh, that uh, is implementing citizen science is based here in, in this year. Uh, this, is, this was done by the DC Water Institute and they have launched um, last year the Backdrop Project. And this is a citizen science project that uh, highlights the pollution sources in, in uh, rivers in Dublin, basically uh, rivers who are uh, located in urban areas. So this project was able to, 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 to make assessment of water quality along the river Leafy, for example, filling some data gaps, especially environmental data gaps, and monitoring these particular actions for the UN SDGs. And this is connected in particular with the SDG 6, which is clean, clean water and sanitation, filling, filling some of those uh, gaps. So just to summarize, uh, just to summarize the main challenges here, um, data generated by citizens is useful, it's valuable, it's rich, but it's always, uh, but always present is the challenge to ensure that data is good and can be trusted. So automation of some of those processes would be key, but then uh, uh, it hasn't happened to a uh, good extension. So, and those technologies, they, they should be using a platform that is connected to the internet. And especially that's easy to access for everyone. So people won't find that it too hard to participate. So an app or a platform that is nicely designed would make a huge difference to attract more people to participate. So, and those, they should be easy to use and low cost because it would facilitate a lot. And, and I think crowdsourcing does refer to, to things like big data, but cost here, it's one of the key issues. So um, if, you are my students. I give you. I would give you an assignment like this. Um, I would ask you to select one of the SDGs. Within that uh, SDG, I would ask you to identify a target and an indicator. And uh, the task for you would be to design a monitoring system using internet-connected uh, devices. So this could be a phone or your laptop. This assignment could be done in group or individually. Maybe in group would make sense and then I think I'll just wait to see what the students would would come up with if uh, they could apply this this technology that they created so I think this is all from me now thanks for your attention and I will be happy to answer any questions that you might have thank you thanks very much Alaska that was so interesting I, I would love to be doing that course. It just sounds so. Um, uh, it's it just. It, it just takes in. You, know, you mentioned all the global challenges, and, and they are out there. So if anybody has an interest in those areas at all, but this this course, this global challenges course, it's really, it's, it integrates the social science aspect and the technology study. So it's, it's giving you the interest. You have an interest in this particular area, but it's giving you the skills then to do something about it. Basically, isn't that really? Exactly. Yeah. Yes. yes. Okay, so what the question here from Dermot is how much electronic engineering is involved with the course? Well, well, I would say ideally um, this course is going to um, have a good combination of the, those two fields, engineering, electronic engineering and, um, and social science. So it really depends on the module I'm speaking about, but yes, there will be um, a lot of, uh, let's say, uh, students, they will be learning about how to code, about how, how to design new technologies. So, uh, and we will have co-teaching. So for example, do you have some modules where uh, you have a lecture from social science from the, the School of Law and Government and a lecture from engineering? So those two lectures, they will combine their knowledge to design something together with, with students that has a social application that's going to address a problem. Mm -hmm. So you'll be learning how to code about how to design devices like wearables or something like this. And um, I cannot give you a percentage, but it's going to be a lot because the whole point here is that when you graduate, you'll be able to design innovative approaches, innovative technologies, not just to design, but especially learn how to implement them. And this is the most interesting part. Um, Emmanuel is asking, can we have a PDF for us to do a reread? Now, Emmanuel, everything is on either on our website or you can order a prospectus. 
um, a printed perspectives if you wanted to um, to read it in your own time. But all the information on these courses are online on our website, dcu.ie, and you can just do a search for the course for Global Challenges. Um, I hope that answers your question. I can imagine it would. Um, okay, Emmanuel, um, sorry, uh, Valeska, that was that was so interesting. Thanks so much. And gosh, it's only starting this year. So to be honest, at the very beginning, it's so exciting for students. Um, so <laughs> I, I'm sure um, I'll be I'll be pushing that course now when I go out to schools as well. It's just it's lovely to hear, you know, the taste or lecture of something that you're so passionate about as well. And um, so thank you so much for that today, Valeska. Thank you. Thank you too.